So we are now recording. Good morning, everybody. Today is Wednesday, July 15th, 2015. My name is Matthew Burgess. I'm with UVA, and I will be your host this morning. So I hope everybody is having a wonderful morning. We've got a lot of really interesting stuff to talk about today. And I see that Lars is here to talk a little bit about what OpenCast does and what sorts of projects they're working on right now. That's going to take up the majority of our time today. But before we get started, are there any project team reps that want to give updates about their projects, where they stand right now? Hi, this is Neil. Um, one thing I'm curious about is uh, I wonder how many people know that there is an unconference planned for uh, um, Montreal in late September, early October. Okay. Well, there is. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll check with the powers that be and see if, uh, you know, there's a reason for restricting. Um, I think it's an open kind of conference, so uh, um, I'll poke around and see if, uh, you know, maybe that'll get out a little more broadly. Um, so that was one announcement. Let me think if there's any other things. Um, we still haven't branched Sakai 11, just FYI, so a lot of good work's happening on Morpheus and responsive design. The main thing we're waiting on is great, the great book next generation stuff still hasn't been merged into um, Trunk yet, so that's one of the big things we're waiting for on Sakai 11. Um, feels like there's maybe one more thing. Uh, let's see, I, uh, just to remind you, we are, I, I, I got caught up, uh, we are posting videos of, you know, the recordings up on our Sakai and Aperio YouTube channels, and I just got caught up on that yesterday. So the Xerti one is up there, and the one before that, I think, on eReserves is up there now. Um, oh, and Sakai Virtual Conference. Yeah, thank you, Wilma. Yeah, that that's the other thing. So um, that's important to save the date on. And Wilma could talk more about that if there's uh, additional things to say. Um, right now, we're just getting started with the planning stages, but um, we did select a date, and hopefully um, a save the date message will be going out soon in the Imperio newsletter, and then we'll be um, sending out other updates on the listserv as we nail down some of the other details. So be on the lookout. Awesome. Thank you, Neil and Wilma, for those updates. Anybody else have some updates that they want to share about projects that are in the works right now? Okay. Looks like we're good. Also, I should take this opportunity to ask if somebody might be willing to volunteer to take some notes in the Etherpad. It's a little hard, for me at least, to scroll back and forth between two screens. So if somebody might volunteer to take some notes for us in the Etherpad, that would be awesome. Or I could just nominate somebody either way. <laughs> Okay, so now let's take a couple of minutes and talk about our JIRA of the week this week, which is SAC 29400, which is the possibility of renaming site info to site settings. If you guys want to pull that up, the link to that Sakai Project JIRA is in the Etherpad. So if anybody has thoughts about that JIRA that they want to share, either on chat or on the mic, that would be great. And thank you, Adam, for volunteering to take notes. That would be awesome. Yeah, this is Neil. Uh, by the way, the Jira of the Week, anyone can nominate a Jira to be on the Jira of the Week. Um, I put this one here because it came up in a 
an unrelated meeting um, yesterday. We were talking on the documentation working group, and it's not clear that uh, there was a lot of discussion on this one, but it wasn't clear that there was a consensus on on it. Um, I think if the outcome is that, that the group just wants the name of the button changed, then probably it would be pretty easy to find somebody to, to do that. If it's uh, more of a behavior change, which has been discussed, um, which perhaps that's a better way to go where it displays one thing for um, to a student view and a different thing for instructor view, that might, you know, that that's a possibility too, but then um, of course that's a bit bigger of a change um, and may not be as easy to, to get done. And uh, now is a good time to have these kinds of discussions because, you know, for Sakai 11. And I also linked to the forum discussion because um, it was, there was a lot of discussion on the forum. So I see some comments from Terry here in the chat that this would be a good change in her opinion. It would be more user friendly. Uh, the site info just refers to the function of the top of the page, but doesn't refer to the multiple utilities. I know that's something that a lot of folks, faculty and students at UVA have also expressed that there's a lot of power and functionality in that tool that's not necessarily represented in the title of it. So I think that those are good points that Terry's making there. Anybody else have comments, questions, thoughts about renaming site info and site settings? I know that some of the people who had originally initiated this were Adam Marshall and Fawe from Oxford who are not on the call today. But if any of you guys have thoughts about that, please feel free to chime in. And Jolie comments in the chat that the name site info is good for students. Um, that's what they see when they click on that tool, but it doesn't necessarily represent how faculty and site owners use that area, which I think is also a good point. And Salwa asks in the chat that we are proposing changing to site settings. Uh, Neil, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, I think the one that was getting the most traction, uh, but that's again why I was bringing it up again, um, is info slash settings um, with a space between them. So. Um, that seemed like where it might be converging, but um. and Terry asks in the chat, is there anything for students that is or cannot be repeated elsewhere? Terry, maybe you could say a little bit more about what you mean by that. Well, the students basically see the the name of the course and the the instructor basic information like that that some that is usually repeated or should be repeated either in the home area or on a lesson page portal or someplace like that. I don't know what real functionality that serves for the students the way that it is now. Because you can also put the roster up if they don't really see the site info roster, but if they you want them to see the other students, you put the roster up so that list is there. I it just seems really redundant from the student point of view for it to even be there mm. for them. And Jerry points out that at Dayton, Dayton students use the site info to see what groups they belong to. I think that's also one of the main pieces of functionality that UVA students use there. It's where their groups are displayed. So if students are in groups, that's where they're going to see that. Um, Jerry also points out that they've discussed migrating that functionality to rosters and then maybe hiding the tool entirely, which is something that UVA has talked about also. Uh, that's we'll a good idea. Comments. Yeah. yeah. Um, from Jerry and Adam and some other folks that are not crazy about the main split, um, which is a good thing to be aware of also. So from, from this, I'm, I'm not sensing that there is really um, a consensus. It seems like if we somehow broke out the functionality or changed the function where things were, 
organized a little bit differently in Sakai, then it would be clearer. But because that site info area is um, has kind of various you know, things that does have the group for the students and has other things for the instructor and the name split seems a little bit awkward to some people. Um, I see Wilma wrote that she knows several institutions that hide site info from students. Um, uh, so, yeah, so it doesn't doesn't feel like um, like it's really got enough. Uh, uh, like it's it seems like there's a lot of interest in in doing something different than what's there now, but it's not clear that we're kind of there yet, based on what I'm seeing. And I think I would agree also that I think there's a lot of consensus that maybe we need to continue discussing the way that site info is set up and the possibility of making it a little more streamlined, maybe dividing up student faculty functionality, but there's not a lot of consensus yet. And we see in the chat, Wilma says that she would be in favor of changing it to settings, but only if we can move some of the student facing content somewhere else. And that does seem to be something that at least many of us can agree on that the possibility of dividing up the student facing content and the faculty facing content or instructor facing content would be great. Right. So I think that, that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, is it only the group stuff that, that we're talking about, or are there other things that we're talking about for student-facing content? Because I think defining that would be a great first step. Absolutely. I think for UVA, it's almost exclusively, if not completely exclusively, the group content, the group memberships. Anybody else have thoughts about that that they want to share? I see in the chat that Jerry says groups only for us as well at Dayton. <coughs> and Terry also says that group memberships make sense in roster, which is something that Jerry had talked about the possibility of as well. And Adam says that inside info, he likes that some site info is there and is exposed to students. So there's a little bit of dialogue there on both sides, it looks like. But Wilma does point out that there is some stuff there, not a lot, but some stuff there that students see, like the site contact mm -hmm. info. So we would have to make sure that that was available somewhere else as well. Any other thoughts about the Jira of the Week, uh, about this particular issue before we move on? What I'll do, this is Neil. I'll I'll, um, I'll take the summary of this and I'll I'll put it directly in a comment in the Jira. And so if uh, if um, folks want to, they can click on. Uh, there's a watcher list if you want to watch the Jira, and that way you'll automatically see comments that go on there. And um, you know, if whatever I write doesn't resonate with you, you can feel free to make a comment or adjust. You know what I say. That's a great idea. Thank you very much for doing that, Neil. And I encourage everybody to watch. Jira so that they can be a part of that conversation and see how that goes going forward. All right, so at this point, I think we are ready for Lars to take the lead and tell us a little bit more about OpenCast and their work and their projects. Lars, do you want me to give you presenter privileges? Do you need presenter privileges for your presentation? I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to do some screen sharing, so that would be great. All right. You should have presenter privileges now. Okay, let's try it. Can you uh, see my desktop now? I don't see anything yet. Does anybody else see Lars's desktop? Oh, okay. Uh, I think I found the reason for that. Um, now you should see it. There we go. 
Okay, so uh, when I read the agenda this morning, uh, I was a little bit surprised. I thought I would t talk about Opencast for 10 or 15 minutes and just show a little bit of a live demo and uh, be done with it. But uh, now I've got 40 minutes, so uh, let's see how long it takes me or which time I need. Uh, but then I prepared a short presentation here, so um, to get a little bit more time. So um, first of all, Opencast uh, became an Apero project just recently. So we just, I think we started the incubation at the beginning of last year and ended kind of last month or something like that. And um, when we talk about Opencast, you always uh, still here uh, talking, uh, people talking about Matterhorn as well, because Matterhorn uh, was the old project name and we just rebranded it to from Opencast Matterhorn to just only Opencast because it's uh, easier to remember and so on. So um, when we talk about Opencast, uh, well, what is Opencast? It's basically a video management and capture system uh, meant for education. So uh, we, you can use it uh, to record and capture and uh, process any kind of videos, but it's really focused at uh, lecture captures. Um, it's of course uh, free and open source. Uh, I mean, we are in a period, so everything's free and open source, I think, but uh, that's not true for our uh, the other lecture capture systems. Yeah, and uh, the main thing about Opencast is that it can be used to completely automate uh, the lecture capture. So you don't have to have people running around in the lecture halls and do the recordings and uploading it to uh, web servers and whatever, but most of it is done automatically. And then finally, it's also automatically pushed to uh, where we want to have it in the end so to distribution channels like uh, the internal player or to distribution channels like YouTube or something like that. So um, here's something uh, I've seen at the Aperio, uh, Open Aperio 2015. So this, uh, this was the outcome of the talk Stephen Marquardt from the University of Cape Town did. And this is a short overview of uh, Opencast, which I kind of liked, so I included it here. And it's nicely uh, that it's um, Creative Commons. So, yeah, uh, when we talk about Opencast, we uh, have a lot of things that are related to open to the software itself. So uh, we talk about capture agents, which are in the lecture halls automatically uh, capturing the recorder as uh, a record um, the lectures and including the camera and including the presentation and so on. You have a related projects. You have, um, as I said, different distribution channels. We have different uh, vendors that are uh, developing for Opencast. So for example, Antwine does a lot of uh, development in Opencast itself. We have Teltech Video Research, uh, which develop um, capture agents, we have 3 to 3 link, we have data path and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of going on in this community. Um, yeah, when you ask who uses Opencast, uh, we don't have a complete list of users. And for example, I just mentioned the University of Cape Town, which I did not include in this list. This is just what I came up with. Uh, most uh, importantly, I think at the moment, the University of Manchester, which is hosting the largest uh, lecture capture system of the world using Opencast. And then there are OTA members like the ETH in Zurich, uh, Harvard is, or Harvard TC is using it, uh, Berkeley is using it, uh, so Spain, uh, we have here some uh, universities in Germany. Uh, Switch, the uh, provider for the Swiss uh, higher education network, is using it. And we can go on and go on. And uh, as I said, we don't have exact numbers, but if we provide an RPM repository and if we have a look at that, we talk about over 400 registered users at that repository. So 
uh, a lot of people are using OpenCast already, and we hope to uh, get even more interested in this. Um, yeah, why OpenCast? So, as I said before, you can, of course, uh, take a camera and record a lecture and upload it to uh, some kind of web service, something like that. Uh, it's no problem uh, using free open source software like uh, OpenChart or FFmpeg and uh, Apache and whatever, but uh, you can use it manually for one recording. You can't use it manually for 40 recordings a week or 1,000 recordings a week. And that's what uh, you want to do, use OpenCast to, well, do it the work for you. So it's mainly about automation. And um, yeah, you also need to have some know-how, how to process videos correctly for using uh, HTML5 plays and so on. Uh, yeah, when we talk about OpenCast features, uh, well, the automatic uh, schedules recordings is, of course, one of the main features, but uh, you can also upload manual recordings. Uh, yes. We sometimes do that for uh, conferences and so on. Um, then, of course, uh, MPQ is used in the background for the video processing by OpenCast. You have automatically distribution to the player, to YouTube, to OAA, MPH, and so on and so forth. Um, we have video analysis tools in OpenCast, like, for example, slide detection, uh, where in the player we will see that in the live demo, uh, segments of uh, the video are identified as this is one slide, and uh, students can then just jump to these slides and so on. Uh, you have text extraction, so you can search in videos. Uh, you have an integrated video editor in the admin UI. You have silence detection. Uh, you have audio analyzation, and uh, one uh, additional thing I added to this list is scalability, which is kind of important if you go from just a couple of recordings to the largest capture system in the world in Manchester. So uh, I brought two examples of uh, where OpenCast is used. Uh, one is from Osterberg here. Since I'm from Osterberg, it was easy for me to go to our admin and ask him some questions and get some data. Uh, data. Um, we are only, a, I would say, mid-sized distribution of OpenCast, so we are one of the oldest distributions of uh, OpenCast since we are in the project since the beginning, and we are using OpenCast, I think, since uh, version 0 0.8. Um, yeah. We have uh, 13 rooms that are equipped with capture techniques, um, we're doing about 40 recordings a week, so fully automated, and no one has to do that or anything. That makes about 160 hours video per week, which is automatically processed. Um, yeah, as I said, we're doing no manual lecture recordings, um, always with two streams. So we have a video for the presentation and a video for the presenter. And, um, and present, uh, we process this in different video qualities so that if we have students with slow connections or with mobile devices like smartphones or something like that, uh, they can uh, get a low res uh, video. And if you have a, a whatever your home TV is, then you have a, a usually a 720p recording. And uh, we automatically distribute this to our LMS. Uh, our LMS sadly is not Sakai, it's a uh, startup. Um, but you also have LTI integration of uh, OpenCast, uh, which is for uh, can you use for Sakai or for Moodle or things like that. Um, yeah, as I said, it's mostly automated, so we have only one person uh, maintaining the whole system here in Osnabrück, and he's only using 50% of his work time. To, uh, for that. And um, yeah, last thing from Rosnabuk is we are crowding all of the uh, faculty. So um, yeah. Then a short example from Manchester, which is the largest capture system in the world, as I said. Uh, they started only in 2013, but already they have more than 200 equipped rooms. Um, they are doing roughly at the moment uh, uh, 
20,000 hours of video recordings per semester. They've on to, uh, since 2013, 50,000 uh, hours of recordings, and uh, Stephen uh, uh, Stephen Philipson from uh, Manchester just tweeted that they had in the last semester over 2.7 million views of the lecture, and uh, they can do that because they have an opt-out strategy. So. If you don't say as a lecturer, I don't want to be recorded, you will be recorded automatically. So that's a bit what um, OpenCast can do. Then for the releases, we usually have two releases per year. Um, one release is was bound to come out uh, 15th last uh, month. It was delayed a little bit because we uh, redid basically the whole uh, user interface in that release. And uh, I didn't make it in time today to cut it before the meeting, but uh, I will bring out 2.0 tomorrow then. Um, yeah. And finally, we have a couple of related projects like uh, Capture Agents, there's Gallicast as a project for uh, the recording itself, there's uh, Parquet, there are um, video portals you can use with OpenCast, there are uh, presenter tracking systems, uh, which is lecture side, um, which you can use and uh, monitoring your eyes so you can see all your capture agent, what they're doing and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's a short overview of OpenCast. And now I'm trying to switch back to the my browser and trying to do some live demo. So, yeah. Lars, so, before you do that live demo, we do have just one question in the chat so far sure. from Salwa, uh, where she asks if you have to use the equipped room or whether you can record from your own computer. Um, you can do both. So uh, the, the equipped room, so uh, it's just that we have an application interface uh, where these capture agents uh, talk to uh, OpenCast and automatically upload things. And we have Capture Agent API, so that we have a lot of vendors you can buy from or build on yourself or something like that. But uh, we'll see that later in the I will do a manual upload of the video. So if you use um, uh, whatever screen recording tool uh, I'm using, for example, FFmpeg sometimes, uh, and just go, hit the upload button and then upload the video, you will ingest it. Uh, in that way into OpenCast and uh, it will still process it and distribute it and so on and so forth. We do not uh, provide a screen capturing tool uh, for a desktop, but uh, I think there are a lot of tools like that out there, so there's no real need for that. I That's hope that answers. It's a question. Um, yeah, uh, I will shortly show the old demo server, which is uh, running OpenCast 1.5 or 1.6. I'm not exactly sure. Just to show uh, the old UI and how we changed it. Um, so admin OpenCast. No, I don't want to remember this. So uh, this is, oh, it's 1.6. Um, what Matterhorn, or I used the old name Matterhorn, what OpenCast uh, looked like in 1.6. And uh, yeah, here you have the process videos and something here in this system, there's only one. And now we'll go, we'll go to the new demo server, and you already see that the UI has changed quite a bit. Uh, by the way, we provide a couple of open demo servers. Uh, I'm using just one of them. And it's always the username and password admin opencast. So if you want to try it for yourself later on, um, I'll write the uh, links to that in the ESAPAD at the end of the presentation. Um, yeah. Now here we see uh, that here are already a couple of recordings in the system. And uh, now let's create a new recording. So I hit, hit event, 
uh, I have to enter some metadata, so required is only a title, so um, let's call it every test. And next, and uh, now you can choose, uh, if you do a manual recording, you would choose upload. Uh, if you use an automatic recording, you would uh, schedule uh, recording in some room. So, uh, Capture Agent would register at OpenCast uh, server, and ZenQ can just select, uh, okay, I want to use a Capture Agent called Parquet uh, to record something or whatever. Usually, you would uh, name them according to the rooms you have or something like that. But for now, I'm just doing a manual upload. So, um, let's see. Um, OCR test, I think that should work, at least up to. Um, then you can select a workflow. In this system, there's only one workflow uh, available, but you can define and configure several workflows. So, for example, you want one workflow for fast processing and distribution. You want a different workflow for um, creating multiple streams and so on and so forth. You want to have workflows including a video editor or not including a video editor. And you can uh, customize that and uh, configure that uh, according to your needs. Um, you can also include options in these uh, workflows. So they are XML files that you can create. And for example, I could here select I want to cut and review and whatever. But for now, I'm just going to publish it directly to the OpenCast media module, which is the internal publication. Uh, as you see, you could also uh, include YouTube or something like that here. So you, of course, need to configure that. And it's not configured on this server. Um, you have access uh, policies you can uh, add to all your videos. So you can say, okay, only instructors can see this video at the moment or only students or whatever. You can also generate or create different uh, sets of rules for that. So let's, uh, the default is just it's private or public. So let's make it public. Um, we have a, here we have a short overview of what, uh, what we entered and let's upload it to the system. Okay, it says it's uploaded. So while we'll we wait for this video to process, let's head to the player. So this is the back end. Um, or no, let's uh, just skip to the other functionalities of the back end. So uh, we've already seen the recording step. Um, you see the capture agents that registered here. Um, you can, I forgot, create series. Uh, in which uh, the recordings are ordered. So usually one uh, lecture series would become a series of videos here as well. Um, you'll see the uh, servers that are included uh, into the system. Um, this is, an, we call it all in one server. So it's just one server hosting the video processing, the admin interface, the distribution, and so on. Usually, if you process a lot of videos, you wouldn't do that. So processing videos is a lot of work, and doing everything on one machine would mean that if you process a couple of videos, uh, it would slow down all other components. So usually you split up uh, OpenCast across uh, several servers. So the usual setup would be three servers or three virtual machines. Uh, one for the administrative stuff uh, and the database, one for the engage stuff, which is uh, the components that students would uh, see, and then uh, one for uh, the processing. And 
depending on how many uh, things you process, and so you would then add uh, more and more uh, processing service. Uh, you can do that because smart phone is opencast is split into several modules. So we have an OSGI architecture and you can just uh, take, I think Sakai has that as well, if I remember correctly. Um, so you can just draw, uh, take a module and put it to another server and replace it by a remote module on that server. And yeah. Okay, and that, now let's go to the play component. So. UI. Okay. Oops, search in the happen process is slash. Okay, so this is what students would usually see. And um, yeah, you see we have uh, three videos that are already completely processed and public uh, and published. And let's go to the player and have a look at this. So uh, here you see we already ha uh, we have two streams. Let's place this back. And you see uh, the presenter is on one side, the uh, presentation is on the another side. You will see uh, down here that there uh, has been some slot detection and it says that here something else is happening. And we can jump to these. Things. Um, yeah, I don't think that the slot detection on this text is particularly good. As we see, it's uh, particularly bad. <laughs> but uh, if you have a regular slide, uh, you will get the whole text that's in this using a Tesseract. Uh, let's stop this again. Um, yeah, that's basically the idea of OpenCast. As I said, two point, oh, uh, one thing we had with 2.0, uh, I forgot, and that's we just recreated our uh, complete official documentation. So we now have a new documentation server, and uh, each version we release gets automatic published here and gets uh, a version version of the documentation, and here we have things like installation guides, uh, user guides. Uh, you've seen uh, so the documentation was split into documentation for users, for um, developers, and for administrators. And for example, here we would have uh, how to install OpenCast manually on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So. With that, I think I can stop and uh, open the discussion for questions or whatever you want to ask me. That's great, Lars. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'm sure people have questions, and so you're welcome to come on the mic or ask them through chat right now. What kind of equipment does a room need to have to be considered equipped? Lars, if you want to unmute yourself, we have a question from Terry about what kind of equipment we need to have in order for a room to be equipped. Sorry, I just tried to uh, answer this while I was muted. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, as a developer, I would usually say it depends, but uh, since people don't like that answer, uh, I'll try to be a little bit more specific. Um, usually for when I talk about uh, room equipped for, for open cast, uh, you would usually have a capture agent in this. A capture agent is basically uh, some kind of device or computer talking to OpenCast. So it's 
uh, taking the schedule and then uh, starting the recording. If you want to, you can uh, build such a uh, capture agent yourself. It's, you, we here in Austinburg use a couple of just, well, des smaller desktop PCs with uh, capture cards from uh, vendors like DataPass or from Hubbug or something like that. And uh, so you can also, if you want to, you can just use uh, webcams as well or something like that. So you just have to have something to run the software on. Um, you can also buy such uh, devices from, uh, well, vendors like, for example, Ancast or from Extron or something like that, uh, where you can attach your cameras and so on. Uh, then what you usually want to have is a camera if you want to record, uh, well, a video of the lecturer or of the blackboard or whatever. And uh, then you want to have some kind of uh, VGA grabber to uh, automatically record uh, um, whatever goes from the lecturer's PC to the, um, to the presenter. So the lecturers don't have to run anything on their own uh, PCs. We had that in the system we had before Opencast and uh, with one or two lectures it would work, but usually we noticed that uh, they would forget to hit the record button or whatever. So um, we used uh, these uh, frame grabbers to just get whatever uh, they sent to the presenter. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So uh, a camera, something to get uh, the camera uh, stream into the PC, uh, a frame grabber to uh, grab whatever is coming from the uh, screen of the lecturer and then the PC who's doing the recording and in the end uploads it to the uh, main server for processing and so on. Another question. Any other questions for Lars? Feel free to come on the mic or come on the chat. Uh, yeah, I said LTI, so um, integrating OpenCast into different LMS is kind of a topic at the moment in the community. So uh, I said that we had a couple of companies working in OpenCast as well. One of them is uh, Antwine, and they are just writing uh, external application API for uh, Switch, so for the Swiss. Uh, high education network and so there will be native integrations into I think it will start with Moodle and Ilias. Uh, we here also use a native integration into Stodapi and then um, yeah for LTI uh, they use the LTI interface for Opencast to integrate it into Sakai so uh, I think it was written by the University of Cape Town um, and they're quite happy with that and uh, yeah I think people are at the moment all also using that for uh, Moodle as well. There's another uh, export or it's more like a distribution channel for Ilias 
Uh, then there's a distribution channel for uh, YouTube if you just want to have your videos end up on YouTube. Um, oh, yes, and then the ETH in Zurich are using uh, OMH MP. No, no, that's not correct. Uh, the Open Archive Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting to uh, push the metadata, including the links to the videos, to their uh, video portal. I think it's called Video Launch. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, all the uh, integrations I can come up with out of my head. And we have a search interface, a REST uh, search interface you can use, uh, which I don't remember. He is, so there's a, a small portal you uh, can use, uh, which then binds itself to the REST endpoints. Apart from that, I don't know a lot of specifics about the LTI integration since I've personally never used it, but yeah. Thank you for that, Lars. Sorry about that. I got Hello, uh, Matt, you there? Sorry about that, guys. I keep getting kicked off for some reason, but I think I am back now. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. So it's about 10 till, so we should probably take a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about our upcoming meetings. Thank you, Lars, for that presentation. That was great. And there's clearly a lot of really exciting functionality going on with OpenCast that I think a lot of schools are going to want to look at. Absolutely. A lot of people in the chat are also thanking you because that really was a great, very interesting presentation. So coming up for the next couple of weeks, next week, July 22nd, Sorry about that, Terry. Can you guys hear me okay? UVA's network yes. is packed up here right at the end of the day. So coming up next week, um, we have Fred or Jesus, uh, who are going to talk about Big Blue Button. Uh, the week after that, uh, we're going to have a panel on the sign-up tool with some folks from Oxford and some additional folks from our team here at UVA. And then on August the 5th, uh, Julia Tingen from Duke is going to talk about Warp Wire. Jolie, I know you're on the call today. Do you want to say anything about your plans for Warp Wire at this point? You don't have to. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. And then the following week, August the 12th, uh, Jerry Timbrook from Dayton is going to talk a little bit about the e-learning fellows program that they've created there, which I think is going to be really interesting because that's something that I know that we are interested in doing um, at UVA. Jolie says in the chat that she's still working on her presentation, so we will continue to get excited about that. Uh, Terry has asked about the possibility of some overlap between Warpwire and OpenCast, so maybe that's something that we will want to think about and talk about during that session. Don't forget that on August the 26th, we have canceled that session because that falls right in the beginning of back to school fall semester for most of us who are here in the U.S., so we have canceled the session on August the 26th. 
But the week before, we're going to have a UX testing update from Wilma Hodges. I got to listen in on their first meeting, and it was a very good meeting. I think there are some very good things that are going to come out of that group. And then the following week, the week after that canceled meeting on September the 2nd, Fireway is going to talk to us about some of the work that they're doing with lessons at Oxford. So we do still need uh, some topics for sessions after September the 2nd. We're pretty built out at this point, but we do still need some topics for beyond uh, September the 2nd. And we have some unscheduled uh, topics that we may want to consider plugging in. Um, a lessons wish list uh, for Chuck Hedrick, uh, a report on LEAP uh, Phase 2. I don't think that Louisa is here today, but that's another topic that some people have suggested. Uh, and also some third-party LTI tool demos. So if anybody has some additional uh, topics that they want to suggest, they can either do that now or just continue thinking about that and we can start to talk about that over the next couple of weeks. Hi, this is Neil. I have one that I wanted to get a little feedback from folks about. Um, so, uh, one of the things I think we'll need is we're going to need some updated QA regression scripts, which are uh, spreadsheets with step-by-step -step on how to do testing. And they're really going to be important for Sakai 11 testing. And there's some new tools in Sakai. I think Lessons never even got a regression script created for it. Uh, so um, I'm wondering if I could have some time where people could maybe help me to think through what kinds of functionality to build the regression test around? You know, like make sure you test X, Y, and Z in, in this tool and, you know, alpha, beta, zeta, and some other tool so that at least they can start putting my head around what regression scripts um, that we could use. And I didn't know if that would be, if people would be open for that on a, on a teaching learning call here and give, give some QA feedback. Personally, I think that sounds like a great idea. I know that we are getting very excited about Sakai 11. We got more excited about it from what we got to see at the conference. And I think a lot of people would probably agree that anything that we can do to help push things along and move things forward sounds great. Okay. Well, maybe um, I'll ask for it to be on one of the agendas. Um, I don't see it as necessarily like a major focal point, but maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So it would take a chunk out of one of the agendas, um, and I guess that would depend on, you know, some 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 issues, uh, some discussions may not need as much time as others. So maybe we can find a good time to fit it in. Yeah, I think that sounds great. Thanks, Neil. There's also a comment from the chat from Marilyn asking if anybody is using Now Comment. Uh, that is something that we are using here at UVA. Uh, we have an integration, and we do use that here. We're starting to use it a little bit more. Um, so if other people are using that or are interested in learning more about it, I think that's definitely a topic we could consider. Okay, Jolie says that she's interested as well. Marilyn, are you using it right now, or are you all interested in picking it up? Okay, Marilyn says that they have it as a tool by request, and Salwa says that she's also interested. So maybe we can add that um, as an unscheduled topic to put on our list for the future, because I know that we could probably find some people, at UVA at least, who could help put that together. I see, and Marilyn notes that you know they have it as a tool by request, but a lot of people don't know about it. So Obviously, you know, marketing these tools, uh, spreading awareness, you know, among faculty and students about how powerful they are, the kind of stuff they can do is a great thing for us to think about as ambassadors for Sakai and ambassadors for the tools that we use. So I think that sounds great. Any other last topics that we might want to suggest or put on the tentative list for the next couple months? Okay. Oh, we have one final one here. Uh, Piazza as an LTI tool.
I know that some people at UVA are using Piazza. I know some other schools are using it as well, so that's probably a topic that other people would be interested in. Okay, well, I will go ahead and stop the recording. This has been a great meeting, guys. Uh, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to come and join us, and thank you especially to Lars for putting together a great presentation, and be sure to check out the recording uh, if there's anything that you might have missed or want to go over again, and thanks to everybody, and hopefully we'll see you all right back here next week. Have a good week, everybody.